Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Raleigh Beach Fireside Chats. I am Mayor Rich Hill from the Village of Raleigh Beach, and tonight we have two guests joining us. First of all, we have Mary Ellen Vanderventer. She's the Lake County Recorder of Deeds. Uh, first elected in 1996, Mary Ellen Vanderventer is serving her fifth term as Lake County Recorder. She is the first woman to hold the office of Recorder. Prior to serving as Recorder, she was Lake County Elections Administrator for 10 years, overseeing 29 local, state, and national elections. Lake County is the third largest county in the state. Mary Ellen's office records over 150,000 documents annually. During her career as Lake County Recorder, Mary Ellen has worked diligently to modernize the office and streamline the procedures for her customers. The newest tool is called Property Check, a service for homeowners to fight against identity theft and mortgage fraud. With a staff of 27, she has expanded office hours to help in working families and has a daily cable TV show to inform taxpayers of county services available to them. A leader among her peers, Mary Ellen has recently was recently awarded the Seven Seals Award of the Lake County Veterans Assistance Commission for outstanding leadership and support of the men and women who serve America in the National Guard and Reserves. We also have tonight with us uh, the Chief Deputy of uh, Record of Deeds Office, Cynthia Heron. Yes. Uh, Cynthia has been the deep Chief Deputy of Record of Deeds Office for three years. Cynthia is a licensed attorney and prior, prior to working for Mary Ellen, was an attorney with Lake County Public Defender's Office for nine years. Before beginning her legal career, Cynthia worked as an executive management for Hilton Hotels. She brings her combination of legal knowledge and professional management to the recorder's office. She's a member of the Lake County Bar Association, where she volunteers for events such as lawyers in the classrooms. She's also a member of the board of, board member of the Lake County, I'm sorry, the Association of Women Attorneys of Lake County. Cynthia lives in Round Lake with her husband, Mike, a firefighter, and her three children, Connor, Claire, and Michael. Cynthia is very active in the community as a board member of the Big Hollow School PTO, Girl Scout leader, and Grant Township Athletic Association baseball coach. Welcome, ladies. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us. This is terrific. Thank we have our Lake County clerks today are going to be our moderators. Uh, we have Nancy Steen from the Village of Raleigh Beach. And if you could introduce your other guests. Probably have to get the microphone closer so it actually picks it up. <laughs> Donna is the treasurer of the municipal clerks of Lake County, and Biddy Boyer is our secretary. Wonderful, okay. thank you. What we'd like to do is begin by giving Mary Ellen and Cynthia an opportunity to give us an overview of the Recorder Deeds Office, um, basically what the office is responsible for, what documents are typically found recorded on a property, and also under names. Okay, well I'll start and you jump in Sounds whenever good. you want to. First of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, it's really fun, it's one of the best parts of our job when we get to go out and talk a little bit about the recorder's office because We've always kind of said that it's the best kept secret around. A lot of people really don't understand everything that we do in the recorder's office. So we're delighted when we have these opportunities to share all the information in our office. I guess the best way to describe it is um, every time you buy or sell a piece of property in Lake County, all of that paperwork comes through our office and we have almost seven million documents in the office that date back to 1844. Now I'll tell you that the first recorder of deeds, his name was Archimedes Winecoop, and he was elected in 1839. So I'm not really sure what he did from 1839 to 1844, because 1844 is the first recording. He must have been getting everything ready. But, <laughs> We, um, the, one of the points of the recorder's office is to keep what they call a chain of title on every single piece of property in Lake County, going all the way back to 1844. So for those of you that own your homes, we have that paperwork in our office. And we also have the paperwork of who owned the home before you, and before them, and before them, and before them, and before them, and before them all the way back to the 1800s. So we like to kind of say that we're the keepers of history as it relates to land in Lake County. And Lake County is the third largest county, so there is a lot, a lot of land in Lake County. But um, one of the things that we want to be sure and tell folks tonight, everywhere we go, is you, if you do own your home, 
if your children own their home, if your parents own their homes, all of you should have a copy of your deed. And it should be kept in a very safe place in your safe deposit box or somewhere where you keep all your important papers. Back in the day, about 20 years ago or longer, when you bought a home, you probably did not get your deed. All of those papers went back to the title company. So if your home is 20 years or older, you really need to double check to be sure that you have a copy of your deed. And if you don't, you need to call us and we'll be happy to get that. If you've been lucky enough to pay off your house, not me, but if you've been lucky <laughs> enough to pay off your house, you should also have a copy of what they call a release or a satisfaction. That comes from your bank. And again, back in the day, the banks used to send that release directly to the recorder's office, and they also paid for the recording. It was in the fees that you paid for. They don't do that anymore. When you are fortunate enough to pay off your home, they send you the release, and it's your responsibility to get it to the recorder's office and to be sure that it's recorded, because in our office we show your deed, we show your mortgage, and if you're lucky enough to pay it off, we want to be able to show your release or your satisfaction. We're not like a bank. When you go buy a car at a bank, they hold the title to that car until you pay it off. We are exactly the opposite. When you buy your home, all that paperwork comes through our office. It's recorded, it's scanned, it's indexed, we keep it but then it's sent out to you. So you really are responsible for all the papers that are affiliated with your home. And to be honest with you, it's the biggest purchase you've probably ever made in your whole life. So you really have to do a little due diligence and make sure that you have everything that's needed. And we're, we're the keeper of all that. Um, that's probably 80, maybe 85% of our recordings. A lot of people don't know that we're also the keeper of all the military paperwork in Lake County. If you served in the military, when you left, you were discharged, and you got your discharge papers, which are commonly called DD-214s. We are the keeper of the DD-214s. You should have recorded those when you left the military, and we have all those. And we work very closely with the Veterans um, Assistance Commission. They, in fact, there is a brochure here tonight that we brought. We worked in tandem with them. You need your DD-214 to qualify for all the programs and the benefits that you are entitled to as a veteran. And the Veterans Assistance Commission can tell you about all those, but we're the ones that have your paperwork. So. Those are probably the two biggest things. We, there's a whole host of other things that we record. We'll record anything from anybody. So if you have old love letters or old report cards, if you have marriage licenses, we've gotten a few divorce decrees. Um, the, the only thing that you need to remember is that whatever you record, it becomes public information. So unless you want the public to know what was in that divorce decree, <laughs> you probably don't want to record it. But we have a whole host of things, and what did I, I forget? <laughs> I was going to spin off that and say the DD-214s are actually the only thing in our office that is not public record. You, right. Nobody but the person who actually is named in that document can see that document. Um, we have online access, and we can talk about that a little later, but if someone were to log on and do a search for records, they would not be able to search the DD-214s because that's full of personal information. Everything else in our office is public information, and it's accessible. It's accessible in the office. It's accessible in your offices. Um, I know a lot of times we get FOIA requests and for public information, and you don't need to do that. We are more than happy to fill your request with whether it's your deed, your mortgage, whatever the case may be, with a simple phone call or an email. But again, those DD-214s are not. Um, I think another thing um, that's uh, very confusing for people, and it was for me for a long time, is 
just because something is recorded in our office doesn't make it legal. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people think, and we have so many people that come in and say, I want this recorded, and, and after talking to them, you kind of piece together that they're wanting some sort of legally binding agreement or something to say, this, this makes this real. When you record something, it makes it part of history, whether it be a property and a chain of title or a judgment from a court, it, our seal or our document number doesn't make that document legal. So I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand, and, and nor would they, because I don't think most people get that explained to them. So. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so Learn just call else. us. Call us anytime. <laughs> and we'll look it up and see if we can find it, and you can go from there. You talked about all the information you're storing. Uh, we had <coughs> talked about the new police cameras and all that body mount the cameras and all, and how much storage capacity we need in order to institute something like that, because we're looking at that very seriously. What kind of capacity are you using in your office? Have you, have you upgraded over the last five or 10 years? We have, we, we continually upgrade. Um, everything is scanned and stored in our, not only our system, but a copy of that is also stored with the company that I say it's magic, I don't know how all this stuff gets done, but there's also a company that manages all this. So all seven million documents are also scanned and stored off-site in case anything should happen here in Lake County. We still have the capability of calling up the vendor and being able to get all of that access back. And you know, the other thing is we still have stored in, I think, Springfield, but they used to um, film everything as well. <laughs> yeah. But you know, all that is still eye readable. And it's also, if anything should happen to the scanned piece, we have the old film that you can really pull out and look at, find your deeds, and then take them and get those uh, printed as well. So I know it is, seven million documents is amazing. Yes, it is. Amazing. And it's quite interesting to actually come into our office if there are any history buffs out there. I love being in there because there are old books, these big leather-bound books, and you see this beautiful penmanship in them because everything was, of course, entered by hand. But you pull out these gorgeous books and you open them up and it, it is like going back in time for a little while. And it's, it's amazing because we have that end of our office and then we have these, you know, a, a server in the basement that's got all these documents scanned on it. But it's a very nice mix and it's, it's fun to bring in classes. You know, we have paralegals that come in or people who are studying, people doing genealogy searches and to pull out those books and they have that musty old book smell and, you know, the pages are yellowed and it, it really is like walking through time in Lake County and it's, it's, it's worth a visit, I would say. And, and I would just add, if you really do love that kind of stuff, we really do have the very first books from back in the 1800s. Uh -huh. And oftentimes when you bought a piece of property, you didn't pay cash. You traded your two horses <laughs> or the vegetables and fruits for an acre. And so it's really cool to go back and look at all that stuff. And Cynthia's right, you had to have A plus in penmanship to have worked in the recorder's office because the, legend, the ledgers are absolutely beautiful. The old-fashioned, beautiful, you know, cursive writing that we learned in fourth grade, and it's really, really stunning. And the very first recording, actually, was a piece of property up in Zion, and it was one acre, and it sold for $1.26. <laughs> so there you go. Wow. We won't get those prices anymore. <laughs> but and, and, and but it's cool to see It is that. cool. And we have chattel books and mm -hmm. stallion records. And I mean, you walk through the aisles of our books, and you pull out these books because you kind of laugh at the names of them. But they're chattel records, and there are stallion books. And it, it's quite interesting. It really is. Some of the girls thought stallion meant something else. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what it <laughs> it is the horses, and the, we had a good time with that for a while. But we, you're welcome to come in any time. And you know, part of our office has um, just a long row of the public terminals. Anybody can come in at any time. You don't need an appointment. There is no cost involved, and our staff will just help you search uh, your ancestors by property in Lake County. You can research your neighborhood. If there's a particular building or church that you want to go back and do research on, that's the kind of stuff that our staff absolutely loves because they get to roll up their sleeves and it's a totally different project than 
the normal day-to-day -day routine. So we encourage everybody to come in. We love that part of it. And I'll jump on that on the staffing too, if I may. So I've been I've been with the office three years, as Mayor said. Um, so I kind of have I I'm probably one of the newest people in the office. That's I, probably I am. true. <laughs> um, but most of our staff has been there over 20 years. Our average, we just calculated, was I think our average was close to 25 years, if not more. It's amazing. It's amazing because nobody does that anymore. You know, I mean, I have a 21-year-old at home, and he's had more jobs than I think I've had already in, you know, in my life. So people don't do that anymore. And the amount of knowledge they have is absolutely amazing. They can open those old books and find exactly what you're looking for. And they're happy to do it. They, they love being right. challenged. They right. want to do that. They don't, not that they don't like sitting at their the cubicles and entering things on the computer, but they love the challenge of getting up and finding something. So if there's something you want to find from back long ago, mm -hmm. we have some great searchers in our office. I agree. Very good, thank you. Was that just the first question? Did <laughs> we it was just the first question. <laughs> Anything else? We're on a roll now. This is question number two, and this is for Mayor Hill. Mayor Hill, can you explain the lien process and give an example of what would prompt a municipality to file a lien against an address. Sure, uh, generally uh, liens are our last avenue that we want to go down. A uh, lien is recorded against the property. So when a property is sold, whatever the lien is for $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, that's when the village can collect the money. The reason we ever file a lien is generally for code violations that are not corrected by the uh, household uh, that, that lives there. We have several avenues. We notify the people, first of all, that you have a violation here, you have a couple weeks to fix it, this has to be done, that has to be done. It can be something as simple as uh, the window's broken or they have an old junky car on the driveway that's not licensed any longer, things like that. It could be something more su substantial also, like their shingles are all blown off, they have a tarp up on their roof for the last six months. Uh, we'll go through that first of all, trying to get them to comply, and if they don't comply, we'll send them through a, a local adjudication process where we have uh, local attorney acting as a judge, and they review all the documents, and we'll try to work with that homeowner to try to get the, again, compliance, get the issue corrected, give them uh, whatever time they feel is appropriate to get that accomplished. If they continue to just really ignore what needs to be done in the community and uh, unsightly in our neighborhood, that's when we move forward and we'll start placing liens against their property. Uh, those recorded, the recorder's office, and I thought that made them legal, though. <laughs> <laughs> So they're recorded and uh, occasionally get paid off, uh, or we get compliance, and uh, sometimes we'll actually just take the lien away then, even though they haven't paid the lien. We're really looking for compliance for the neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, no one wants to live next to a house that has a big blue tarp on the top of it for six months, uh, or the grass is uh, two feet tall, or the windows are broken. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that. And it's been very successful in most cases. Uh, during the foreclosure events that happened uh, several years ago, a lot of those foreclosed houses, the liens were just wiped away, and we lost anything we had on those. Uh, but again, somebody else came in, they fixed up the problem, so I guess in the long run we did get compliance, which was what we were looking for, but the liens were wiped out. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the thing on liens that I think is really, really important for everybody to know. You have explained the municipal part of yes. the liens. But there is a whole host of other liens that can be um, put on against your property. It could be a lien from the IRS. It could be a lien. Um, maybe you hired a contractor to paint your garage. And you agreed on the contract. You agreed on the color of the paint. You agreed on the price. He painted it. You came home from work and were mortified that that is not what you had agreed to. You have every right <clears throat> to, well, no, I shouldn't say that. So <laughs> you're probably not going to pay him. He has every right to put a lien against your property for payment of the contract that you had agreed to. Here's the thing with liens. 99% of the time, you don't know that a lien has been filed against your name. 99% of the time, nobody tells you. And we have worked with our legislators for a long, long time, hoping that we could find some kind of law that says, if you file a lien against somebody, you are also required to tell them. Because what happens is, unless you go to sell your home or refinance, and you're doing all the paperwork for that, that lien is going to show up and you're gonna say, 
wait a second, I had absolutely no knowledge of this. So what I like to go out and tell people, and one of the real reasons that we're grateful for being here, is we tell people everywhere we go, once a year, you make your doctor's appointment, your dentist appointment, you put all the appointments on the calendar, you need to call the recorder's office and say, can you just run a real quick check against my name? And if anything's happened in that year and there's any liens placed against your name or your property, it's going to pop up. And you're going to be able to resolve that while you're happy and healthy and have your wits about you. Because I'll tell you, we have had many a spouse come in whose wife or husband has passed away. They are grieving. They're not thinking straight. It's, it, there's, it's a sad, sad time. They're trying to sell their home or downsize, and there's a lien on their property that they had absolutely no idea about. So our message is just always, 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 once a year, a year and a half, call the recorder's office and see if anything has been put against your name. I had a lady come in one time. Her husband had passed away. She wanted to sell the home. There was a lien on there from the IRS. Well, you know, good luck with that. But lo and behold, after about a year and a half, we, along with her and another attorney, proved that the lien was not against her or her husband. The IRS had filed the incorrect lien against the wrong name, but it took almost two years to clean that all up so that she could sell her home and move on. So, and she had absolutely no idea that it was there. You've got to, got to, got to check and call our office about any kind of lien. Now you mentioned earlier, though, that they can go online and can they check that online also themselves? You can. You can. We are, the way our online search system works is um, there's a subscription fee. Uh, the base subscription fee is a $5 per day fee, and then it goes up in packages from there. And the reason we have that is it, it's our hope that a fee will dissuade those people who are just surfing online to try to steal information. Um, that's what we hope is, is doing. Um, so and yeah, it also someone gives us a little control. Right. We have your credit card. We know uh, that who's it's looking. really you. Right. Otherwise, we have absolutely no idea who it is. So, pe so people can. They can right. pay that, that fee and go on and search from home. Um, and we strongly recommend people do that. Um, but we also say call us because it, it, we're more than happy to help people do You're that as experts, well. You're the experts. Can I, may I ask, if, if somebody does find a lien on their property, how do they go about having that lien released? Well, we actually have <laughs> these handy um, pamphlets in our office, and actually we have a lot of handouts for people, and we do have that information on our, um, on our website. Um, it can be as simple as a release of lien is really what it comes down to, and it would just depend on who issued that lien. You could, once you pay that fee or that debt, you can ask them to write a letter. You can ask them to fill out a form. You can go online and they have lien releases that are blank, and you can have them fill it in. Once they fill it in, they, that person who issued it, or you can come in and have it recorded. Now the trick, the other trick with our office in addition to our office not legalizing a document, we also don't have the statutory authority to review validity or legal information in a document. So people could technically come in and file a lien, just like the IRS did, against mm -hmm. the wrong person. Mm -hmm. um, they could record a lien that wasn't necessarily the right thing to do because we can't, we're not there to question the legality of documents. Um, so you can release a lien by getting a document signed or, or proof that something was paid, uh, come in and have it recorded, but you also have to keep in mind that that original lien doesn't go away. It, the physical appearance of that document in our system will always stay there because it will be searchable, someone will be able to find it, but you will have that second release on top of it showing that it's no longer active. Because remember we talked about the chain of title and that's what the office is all about. So it's your deed, your mortgage, uh-oh, a lien, and then you're going to have to show that that lien has been paid or released. Otherwise, the last thing they see is, uh-oh, that lien. And it lingers and it hangs out there until something has been done with it. So on every piece of property, there is a chain of title that has all those papers attached to it. And you've got to have, you have to have a beginning and an end 
and then a beginning and an end. You have to be sure that it's all cleaned up before you can sell or refinance or, you know, God forbid, have your children have to take care of all that. You want to be sure that all of your paperwork is in order. And I think sometimes, to go back to your original question, I think sometimes people come in and say, okay, my contractor put this lien for $100 on my house, but here I have this receipt showing I paid for it. Um, and my answer usually is, that's not a release of lien. We'll record it for you, but a title company may not recognize that as a, because it's not an official release, it's just a, a receipt. If unless it's an official release, we can't say for sure how a title company will use that when they search your property. So we will record it for you, of course, absolutely. And we will you know, cross-check it with the document number of the lien, so hopefully someone will pick it up. But it's really important to go back to the entity that put that lien on your property and get a release from them if you've satisfied that debt. So if there's a malicious lien like that, is there any way it can be expunged through a judgment from a judge? It can. You would obviously have to go to court and file a case against them. The only time a document is taken out of our system, and it's very rare, mm -hmm. the only time we can actually physically remove the presence of a document is through a court order. Okay. Um, I've seen it once in my three years, and everyone was shocked that it happened. Um, and, and I was too, to be perfectly honest. But you would need a court order, and it would be the judge would have to be very explicit, saying this would need to be, you know, either removed from the quarter system or expunged, or whatever the case may be. Well, I feel for the like lady with the IRS document uh, leaning against her property. She that was done invalidly, but it's always going to be there. And makes her look bad. Exactly. So. Exactly. That's why there has to be a beginning and an end. Yeah. And oftentimes it may not be expunged how you and I think, mm -hmm. taking it off the rolls. It's expunged by having the ending, the which closure. is the court order or the release or some letter somehow. Because really the people that are gonna go back and look at that are gonna be the title companies and the attorneys and the banks when you go to sell your home. And honestly, they really do know what they're looking for. They, they're looking for the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end. They know that if a, a lien is there, there's pro they know to look for the release or the, the court order. If it's not there, that's where the difficulty comes in because frankly, you're not gonna be able to sell your home until all that is figured out and satisfied. And you know, again, it's the biggest purchase you've ever made. You have to take a little bit of you have to get in there and make sure that everything is okay. You forget. You, you forget about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um. Cynthia and Mary Ellen, your office has done a lot to combat identity theft. Can you share some of the different things you've put into play, some of the methods that you've used? And in particular, we've all heard about property check and would love to hear a little bit more about it. Well, you can do property check. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <let's talk> about <laughs> property That's check. your baby. You all go right, right ahead. Okay. Um, like Mary Ellen has said already, it's you know we always advise people to call our office once, twice a year to check and see if anything's been recorded. However, within, I think it's been a little, almost a year and a half ago, we put into place a system called Property Check. And what it is, you can sign up via email or text message to receive an alert that a document has been recorded against your name or your property. So if someone came in and recorded a lien, whether it was the correct lien or whether it was um, an incorrect lien, you would either get a text message if you gave us your phone number or an email to your email system saying, hey, d this document was just recorded. If you didn't record it or you didn't know something was being recorded, please call our office. You can enter as many variations of your name as you like into the system because our system is the, the easiest way to search our system or the best way is by name because we are grantor, grantee based. So there are um, places in property check where you enter your name and we strongly suggest you enter as many variations of your name as possible. I'll use my name as an example. My name is Cynthia Prime Haran. So when I entered it, I entered Cynthia Prime Haran, I entered Cynthia Haran, I entered Cynthia Prime, I entered Cindy Haran. I en so I entered as many ways that I think someone could put my name into a document into that system. 
I did the same thing for my husband, who doesn't have as many names as I do, but <laughs> we went down the list as well. And then we entered our property address. And I will tell you what, one day I was driving to work and I got a text message from the recorder's office saying a document had been recorded against my property. And I, I didn't record it and I didn't do anything. So I, I did kind of panic, even though I worked there. Um, and in the end, what happened was we had been updating the system. And so someone made a correction to a mortgage we had done a few years ago and it popped up. But it, it works, you get that. And I will tell you, your first thought is, what did someone do to my property? Because it does happen. Um, we have, and I wish I knew how many people signed up for property check, but we're we, almost a little over 4,000. Fantastic. Today, so it's, a little over 4,000. People, people are very interested in it. Um, obviously, mortgage fraud, fraud and identity theft are one of the biggest problems we have in this country. And after the mortgage crisis and the foreclosure problems, and you know, this really gives people peace of mind. Because that way, if you do forget to call us, you're just going to get alert if something happens. Um, it's been going very well. I know we've been going different places trying to tell people and remind people to sign up for it. We put it in our newsletter. We remind people to use it. Um, we've told uh, the judiciary to use it because they, they have a lot of issues with some um, different groups of people filing liens against them. So it's come in handy. Is anyone here signed up for it? Is there a fee for that at all? No, there's oh, not. Okay, not at then. all. It's quite separate from our online search. It's free. It's it you know it runs 24/7. So if someone happened you know if our system someone came in at five o'clock, right at five o'clock, a few minutes later you're going to get a text saying something happened. Nice. And we do get phone calls from people saying, I didn't record anything. And a lot of times you can backtrack and they did or someone did it for them. But um, even if they refinance, even if they refinance, that paperwork yep. comes through, and you think oh, you wouldn't have thought of that, but right. you get an alert just from that. Yeah. yeah. So I strongly suggest everyone sign up for it. We have cards here with the information. It's very easy to do, and if if it's not easy for you to do, we're more than happy to walk you through it. Even if you come in the office and want to do it, um, it's it's just a little bit of peace of mind because there are groups out there that record documents trying to take property from people, and it's. It's quite frightening. We've been very lucky here in Lake County um, with that type of activity. We haven't seen a lot of it at all. Cook County has had a problem with it. Um, but this system seems to be working, and we do get a lot of people calling very interested in it. You know, in terms of identity theft and, and mortgage fraud, there, there's one vehicle that all the bad guys seem to use, and it's called the quick claim deed. And it's just, a, it's just that. It's, it's very quick and it transfers property from one person to another person. <clears throat> Several years ago, we talked the legislature into adding at least that the names have to be notarized on this particular deed, this particular transfer, and that has cut a lot of that identity theft down. But believe it or not, we're, the recorder's office in Waukegan, in the county building, we're kind of the only game in town. It, it's our building, and. It's our office, and that's where all these transactions take place. So to be honest with you, we have video cameras in there. Um, we really do know who's in there, who's recording what. We're very, very careful with our old books. We don't want anybody walking out thinking they're beautiful or just forgetting and walking out with things. So we really do monitor all of that, and we've done that for a long time long, long time. So property check and making sure everything's notarized and having the cameras going all the time and we're just very cautious and you know again everything is public information unless you're the bad guy and we don't want you to have that public information so it's kind of a delicate balance and we do some things that we're not required to but we're very very careful with your information on your deeds often is your signature that somebody could copy. It's your address. Back in the day, it was your social security number. We put a program in place a couple years ago to redact or take out every single social security number in almost 7,000 documents. But we did it. And so if you were to pull that up out of the public, you'd see all that, but you'd see one big black box where that number is and you know that's entirely to keep people on the up and up and 
hopefully nothing happens. And like Cynthia said, we've been very, very lucky in Lake County. Very lucky. Our, our staff is also very, <clears throat> excuse me, our staff is very diligent about looking mm -hmm. at documents and people who bring them in. And while, like I said a little while ago, we're really in a bind because we can't, we're not supposed to question what the validity of a document it is or, or what are you really trying to do with this document. And we do not have legal authority to do that. But I guarantee you, our staff has been there so long that when something funky comes in, they know. And they will come back to me and say, I've got a weird feeling about this. And there are certain statutory requirements that most documents have. So most documents that get recorded in our office have different requirements. Some, like Mary Ellen said, you can come in and file a love letter. That has no requirement. Important documents do. So we look very carefully when something comes in that just raises an eyebrow, we take extra time to see if there is a legal way we can reject that document just to be safe because some things just don't sit right and you can't put your finger on it or someone just seemed uneasy recording it. So our staff is really, really good about questioning it and coming back and saying, can we look at this? Can we, is this right? Is that? So please be aware they, they are there and you know, whether you're signed up for property check or not, the people in our office are being very careful with your documents that come in. Great. Very good, thank you. And our last question is for Mayor Hill. And Mayor Hill, this is an issue that I think, unfortunately, many municipalities have had to deal with since the downturn of the economy 10 years ago. We would like for you to talk about how the village is addressing vacant homes, foreclosures, and abandoned properties. Uh, the village is uh, <coughs> right in the process right now of uh, improving our compliance with that. We're looking at a new ordinance called the uh, Vacant Housing uh, Ordinance that will uh, require property owners of vacant property to list uh, with us their contact information so we know who's responsible for the property, how to reach them. If they have a management company, the management company will uh, have all the information with us also. So they, if there's a problem with the property, we can contact the right people right away. That was probably the biggest problem we had with foreclosures is you didn't know who to contact. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's those houses that fall between the cracks where the homeowners move out, the house hasn't been foreclosed on yet, so the homeowner's gone, the bank doesn't own it, Nobody wants to take responsibility. Those are probably the toughest right now to deal with. Uh, but as far as the vacant housing itself, uh, that's what we're moving towards right now. It's been difficult uh, trying to find the property owners. This should help us quite a bit in that respect. Uh, we'll use several different avenues to find out the vacant housing. Uh, in fact, we have Lisa here today. She's in our audience. So Lisa, would you mind coming up and maybe explain a little bit more about that? She's our uh, neighborhood services uh, coordinator. Came with the village recently. Now, Lisa and I go way back. She she is the foreclosure expert. And <laughs> we had worked together years ago on these programs. So you you have got the cream of the crop here. All right. <laughs> well, uh, as the mayor said, um, we're actually taking several steps. The vacant building ordinance is a great start because it'll help us get a handle on those properties out there that are vacant and abandoned, um, properties we would like to uh, be able to make sure they're secure, they're safe, uh, the grass isn't growing too tall, but again, we don't, we haven't been able to contact them. So this is a first start in compiling that list. We're also looking at other avenues we have to identify um, wh where some of those troubled properties are. Everything from um, where there's been very little water usage, if we've got a lot of liens on a property, that can mm -hmm. be an indication. And one of our first steps is getting that information systematically and organizing it so we can take some steps. Um, we've already uh, done quite a bit. The village, even before the foreclosure crisis, was very proactive in terms of acquiring distressed properties, rehabbing them, and getting them occupied. And that's something we're looking to do more of. We recently received a grant that will allow us to acquire about 15 or so blighted properties, de demo them, um, and we'll, we're continually looking to do more of that. Um, and not just scattered sites, sometimes that's the easier way to do it, but what we're really looking at with some of this data gathering, uh, with all of the tech tools we have today, is to map 
where those vacant properties are and see if we can take a more comprehensive approach to an area and go in there um, and do a number of houses at a time. That's going to be very valuable uh, when you can hit a certain sector and take out 10 or 5, 10 houses in that area all at one time, it makes a big impact. The neighbors see it and people feel better about their neighborhood and when you drive through the neighborhood you don't see that blight anymore mm -hmm. and that, that can be huge. I really, I congratulate you for doing all of that and sometimes it, you know, folks should know, sometimes it's very difficult to track back the owner of those properties and a lot of times if, um, if a company, as they say a company, has, has purchased those, oftentimes the deeds are in trust which is great protection because you can't find the name of these folks who own it. It's trust number one, two, three, four, five, and there's no names on there. So it is really hard work a lot of times to find the owners of these pieces of property. And nine times out of 10, they don't live in the neighborhoods. They don't live in the cities. Right. They're long gone, and, it's, and they don't really care. So it's really very difficult, but I think you're doing a great job on that. That's wonderful. Oh, we have a very proactive board. Oh, go ahead. Our, I'm sorry. Our office actually can kind of track how the, the mortgage or the foreclosure issues are trending because we record property information. And so when Liz Pendens and when foreclosures are filed, they come and get recorded in our office. So we've been keeping track of the amount of documents that are recorded in regards to foreclosures for years. And 2012 for Lake County was the height. I, I, we had close to 10,000 foreclosure related documents. That doesn't mean 10,000 foreclosures. It doesn't mean, it means 10,000 documents that were related to foreclosures of properties were recorded in Lake County. And I can tell you, and I live out here in the western part of the county, as you heard, I had both houses on each side of me were empty for a long time, for two years at least. And so I, I know it was bad. It was really bad in 2012. But I can tell you that each year since then, just working in our office, the numbers are just coming down. And I know that doesn't help the individual people who are losing their homes, because they're still there. But it's mid-May, and we just have just around 1,000 documents recorded relating to foreclosures. So it is getting better. But those homes are still there. Um, and also, the 19th Judicial Circuit here in Lake County has a mortgage, I'm sorry, a foreclosure mediation program for people in case you didn't know that. That's something good to know and it's on, that information is on our website as well. And they work really hard with people who get involved in that program to stop the process and help them save their homes. So that's something for people to look at also. Very good. <clears throat> As I was mentioning, uh, we do have very proactive staff in the village here. They've been very good at keeping us on the forefront of these issues, uh, whether it be through their associations they're members of or the, the associations we're members of as the elected officials also. The board's also worked very well together to make things happen, which is, uh, I, can't, I can't thank my board enough for being workable and professional in all they've done. Uh, uh, the village clerk also is here tonight. Uh, <laughs> Yay. Are there any questions from the audience tonight? Do we have any questions? Unscrupulous contractors, what do they have to go through to put a lien on the property? Is there any requirements that make it legal? Or do they just file it with you? Well, usually for, for the contractor or folks like that, there is a standard form. Sometimes it's called a mechanic's lien or contractor's lien. There is a standard form and for it to be recorded, it has to have all the components in there. If it doesn't have your name or it doesn't have the amount that you agreed to, it gets rejected. We cannot record it. So it does have, I would say, seven or eight concrete things that must be on that piece of paper and then it can be recorded. Now, does that make it legal and binding? Here's the problem. You can, you can record it and it stays recorded and if you go to take action on your home, you're going to go downsize and you want to sell, that piece of paper stays there until something happens to it, until it's released or, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time with the title companies asking them, how far do you really go back? You know, how far back do you look at all this paperwork? And their rule of thumb is 20 years. That's a long time. So if you had a not so pleasant contractor 
16 years ago and he filed something on your piece of property, it's still there. And you've got to somehow figure out a way, even if the guy's long gone and there's no recourse, I suppose just going to get a quick court order to have some beginning and end. You've got to have an end to that lien that was filed. It's a gyp. I totally agree with you. Doesn't it seem odd that they don't have to prove anything? They don't have to prove it. Not only do they not... Not only do they not have to prove it, my beef is they don't have to tell you that they did it. Now, it's certainly in their best interest to tell you because they want the money. They want you to pay up or they want you to adhere to the contract that you agreed to, but they don't have to tell you that they put that on there. It drives me crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't seem right. And, and it's so hard to have people come in and, I mean, people are in dire straits, you know, trying to sell their home and they're held up with these liens. And, you know, I, I, based on your question, no, it's not like they need a court order or a judgment saying, yes, this person, I judge, you know, Cindy say, yes, you owe me $100. Have to show no. And you know, we often meet with our legislators throughout different times throughout the year, and this really rises to the top every time, that we truly and firmly believe that if you're gonna put a lien on somebody's property, you need to for sure tell them that you've done it. And I always say, unless it happens to one of the senators or the representatives, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. But you know, we can. We, well, we're, we're, not, we're not legally required to, but we have sent out different postcards over the past. It's a lot of work to try to figure that out. You know, we're, we're the third largest county in the state, but anytime we can, we do. Oftentimes, we'll just make a phone call and tell the person that this has been... We do that. We actually do that with quit claim deeds. Because, as Mary Ellen said, the quit claim deed is another way that someone can just try to come in and sh take your house right out from under you. So, when a quit claim deed is recorded against your property, we do. We there are postcards because in, it's a little more important, not vitally less important than a lien, but it's a deed. You just lost your house. So, when that gets recorded, a postcard gets <clears throat> excuse me sent out to the original owner immediately. That's on why that. We're Exactly. exactly. I was going to bring it right back around to there. That's exactly. why we were, you know, we finally put this property check in because now instead of waiting 20 years when you go to sell your house and saying, I, no way, and you can't prove it, you can't backtrack, now you'll get a notification right away. And that's, that's why I'm so glad we put this in because it really does matter and it takes two minutes to sign up for. But your idea is still a really good idea and I think we'll probably go back and revisit that because you know we worked so hard on property check and then we had worked so hard on the quick claim deed notifications that you know maybe it's time to go back and revisit the liens and see if there's a way that it, maybe at least the current ones I don't know how far we would be able to go back technically computer wise to gather all that information but maybe we could get it from the last couple of years and be able to send something out. I mean, that's why we love these <laughs> questions and answers because it gives us. Just as an example, I know yeah. big county. How many leads get put on properties in a day? I mean, if you were just to say on average, is it crazy? I mean, we're talking thousands a day, hundreds a day. No, I. But a lot. I mean, I would say a good per day, and, and we're not as busy as we used to be back in the day. But I'm gonna. I'm going to say around 15 to 20. You'd be shocked. Yeah. You'd be shocked. You said that there were several requirements that had to be met on the form to file a lien. Yes. Is, is one of them a requirement to prove, like a contract, to prove that, that you owe the money? Well, yes. They are supposed to, they would fill out this form and they are supposed to attach the contract that you had originally agreed to. Now, you know, nobody, nobody's there to verify that all those details are correct, but there's supposed to be enough information in there, the dollar amount, what it was for, was it to paint the garage or build a fence, and the contract that you all had agreed to. That's all part of that filing of that lien. 
It, no, I'm telling you, it's people are shocked when they hear this. Shocked. Anybody can. Yes. yes. They really yes. Your job. You are the reporters. Right. 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 And it's very it's it's so frustrating for us, and and it is as an attorney, it's very frustrating to see things and to know people aren't getting noticed, to know it's very frustrating. But yes, I I've had people I want to put a lien on and. We have to record certain, you know, we can't right. turn them away. It's not that, there's not that many people running around filing random liens, but I mean, it does happen and we try to dissuade them. We try to say, you know, you'd be better off, my favorite thing to tell people, if you really want this to stick, if you, this person really owes you this money, I would want to go to court and get a judgment because that's what makes it valid. Getting our number on it doesn't. A court order does. If someone signs up for the property, <coughs> Yes, yes, you can. You can. You can search your name if you went online and signed up to search, or you can come into our office and search your name, you and search anything that's been filed. And as long as it's your name was spelled correctly or entered correctly by the person who recorded it against you, everything recorded against you would come up by your name. Yes. <laughs> Just, you know what, do a property check and then call us and let us run a quick name, check on your name. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way. So if you do it, you can see it. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And we can send you copies of everything that you might not have. That's part of it too. You know, when you go online to search, sometimes it is a little tricky and you can miss things because really the search is for the banks and the lawyers and the title companies, you can go on there and hunt and peck a little bit and look around for your neighborhood and how much did that house sell down the street. <coughs> but unless you're really savvy and you really know what you're doing, and if you're doing it to protect your investment, you really want to be sure you're doing it the right way. And I, it's just easier for us to do it. Just come. You just call us. Just call. You can just call. I mean, it, and I know Mary Ellen always says our office. Someone answers the phone it, unless it's after hours, and go, then it goes to voicemail. But during business hours, someone will answer the phone. They're not going to say press one, press two, press three. Someone will answer, and they will help you. They will do a search. You know, we always do have to say we're not title. We're not a bonded title company, so there may be tricky things we don't even see, but. Realistically, for the general population, you know, if you don't have things in a trust with a fancy trust name, and Mary Smith and Mary J. Smith, we will find it and we will be able to help you. And they really do like to help. They really do. And I just have, I just have to say one thing because that is one of the things that we are the most proud of, is that when you call our office, you get a real live human being. There's no buttons to push. There's no menus to choose. A live person answers and she will direct you to the department that you're looking for. They will answer the phone live and in person and take the time to figure out what you need. And again, they'll send you all the necessary papers. You just need to be sure you have all those papers in your safe deposit box. And you've got to be sure that no lien has been filed against your property. That's the message for tonight. Just be sure there's no liens. I understand that you need for the $5 for the uh, credit card thing, doing it online. When I call, my name is Steve Malmquist. When I call you, my name is Dick Barr. And I'd like to know this information, but my name is not. I know exactly what you're saying. And so how, do you, how do you know this? It's just a really fine line. And what we will not do is read through the document for you. We're not going to double check your social security number or talk it or say it out loud. Out loud. We're not going to do any of that. But it's true you can come in and check, you know, all your neighbors and in, in your neighborhood and you can call and we're happy to check your house and um, can you tell me how much the house down the street sold? We certainly can. We can look that up. It's just it is all public information, and frankly, we could not care. It's not our job to care, but we want to care, and we're very careful about it. And 
You know, sometimes you just know if it's the bad guy or not. You can tell by the questions and what it is that they're wanting. We, we, unless it's your paperwork, we're not going to send it to you. I'm not going to send Sam the paperwork for Steve. You know, we're, we're very careful about that. But we always say if you really, really want to be the bad guy, you're going to be anyway, and there's nothing that we can do to stop it. We're just trying to be really protective of all the papers that are there. I'm on the computer system maybe three or four times a month to search for a deed or a release um, in real estate. So it's not worth it for me to buy the annual, uh, so I'll spend five dollars uh, each each month. Can I call you on one of those times and will you happily say, sure, here's the deed, here's the deed? Yes, the only thing we will not happily do is do a search for you because we're not bonded to say 100 okay. percent absolutely absolutely give us a call we're happy to do that we just can't guarantee for a search if you're purchasing this property that we have covered every single base and we haven't missed anything and you know we're, we're just not accredited to do that that's what the title companies are for but of course, of course you can call us. That's our job. We're happy to do that. That's great. If they tell you you're on the phone too long, then no, they won't do that. You'll be fine. Are the big books, are those, are those going to be happy or are you guys Oh, they've all been scanned. We, the big books are stored separately. Although we have um, one, two, three, maybe four or five rows of them, because we just could not part with them. They're so pretty and so beautiful, and we wanted people to still be able to use them. So we have about four or five or six rows. However, everything in storage has already been scanned. So you can come into the computer and look up a book and see the pages of those books. You're just not physically picking up the book and looking through. That is so awesome. It is really neat. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Exactly. We were very afraid of that. We had a company come in one time and re, I was going to say rebinded, re rebound all of the beautiful old books because they were really, really getting frayed. And, and they are gorgeous and they're so historical that we want everything to be saved. And so when we scanned the old books, all that information is on the computer as well as being in another state with our vendor in case anything should happen here in Lake County. All that has been preserved and saved in an undisclosed location, but we have it. We still have all of that too. So it's, it's, it's really neat. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to come visit. I encourage all of you to come down. If you're ever in Waukegan, come to the county building. Come, pull up your name, just look at your neighborhood, look at your family history for just a couple minutes. You'd be surprised how much information is there, and all the tools are there, and we're happy to help. It's a great place. It is. I have, I have one more question, this is just out of curiosity. I know in Cook County, it has a, a communities where you'll pull up covenants from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They have some very strange restrictions about who you can sell it to, who's allowed to buy in this neighborhood. Do we have that in Lake County? Yes, we do. We were looking at some documents the other day where um, you know, Susie had to sign as a spinster, and there's a lot of um, old legalese from back in the day that is not politically correct today, that's for sure. But it's, that's what's so cool, too, is to go back and look at that and, and see how those documents and just how all of that has progressed. It's really fascinating. Well, we thank you all for being here tonight. I think we had a very good uh, chat. I learned some information myself, and I'm definitely going to go online and sign up for that also. Well, it's a thanks. property check. It's great. Thank, a great you program. So yes. thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you so much for having us. It was our pleasure. Yes, we love to come out and talk about the reporter's office. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, please join us next month. I believe we have Congressman Bob Dole coming out to uh, Round Lake Beach. Great. Just down with the fireside chat, and uh, enjoy your summers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.